Hey, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. It's Amelie Ollier, and you should be pretty close to finishing up with the video uh, review course, but we've got uh, Dr. Mimi Secor and Dr. Kathy Ballridge, who's gonna act as our moderator tonight. And uh, we're excited about getting some questions from you, and we're anxious to hear about how the course has gone so far. So we had a fun morning session, um, and then, um, we, you know, are ready for, ready to wrap this up with you, but we want to hear from you, especially on, on how you thought it went, and we want to bring you in and make you feel like you're, you're with us. So, I don't know that we have any questions yet, but I would like to, um, to let Dr. Mimi, sorry, how about Kathy, could you uh, give us kind of the reminder about Q&A and chat for everybody? I sure can, absolutely. All right. So... Um, my button there. There we go. So be sure and use the chat function if you want to ask uh, just a general APA question. We have some great APA support staff that are on with us and they can help answer questions for you there. Technical questions with the videos, those sorts of things. If you have a question for Dr. Amelie or Dr. Mimi, then use the Q&A function. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A. Click on that and type your question in so that I can uh, ask the question out loud. Because like we said before, if you have a question, there's probably someone else that has the same question. So don't hesitate to ask it. Yeah. So let's see, who do we have uh, participating tonight? So it looks like our participants have grown tired and weary over the last two days. <laughs> I'm looking uh, at our number of participants that's decreased, but I see a lot of chatting going on. Well, it is Friday, and, Amelie, TGIF. I, I know, and you know what? I'm sure that everybody's had week, a week like we have, and that's been very, very busy. And um, Of course, you can't go out, right. so might as well be on the call. Yeah, you might mm -hmm. as well be on the call. Um, it looks like a question popped in there, Kathy. Let's see what somebody's All wondering right. about. Let me get it. Um, Dr. Mimi, this is from Beverly. Question for AUB with heavy bleeding. Which oral contraceptive is best that contains iron? You know, it's kind of interesting, Beverly, as you asked that question, I immediately thought of an intrauterine contraceptive that contains norgestimate, that contains, excuse me, levonorgestrel to control that bleeding. Now, birth control pills can do it, but it usually is a, a several month process. Whereas if you can insert a Mirena or a Kylena, often the bleeding lightens much more quickly. And you know, Beverly, you wanna make sure it's kind of a, it's a workup for abnormal uterine bleeding, heavy bleeding. You don't wanna just put them on birth control or insert an intrauterine contraceptive without making sure that you've checked for anemia, made sure the thyroid's okay, ruled out pregnancy, um, any inherited coagulopathies. You've got a process you need to go through. Uh, if it's an older woman, make sure that she couldn't possibly have uterine cancer. So if you're really concerned and you're in primary care, it's always a great option to send them over to OBGYN if it's heavy abnormal uterine bleeding, especially in an older woman. Uh, Mimi, what would be part of your differential diagnosis if the person with abnormal uterine bleeding was, uh, say, 30? 30 always pregnancy, fibroids, um, infection like PID, even though 30 isn't super high risk, as though it's not as high risk as being under 25, it's still um, high risk. And, and thyroid. Thyroid, as you know, can act up anytime, uh, but sometimes in women in their 30s. I'm glad you brought up and uh, anemia for gosh sakes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the thyroid gland because uh, I bet our people, our participants listen to the endocrine lecture this afternoon, which might bring up some, some questions, but uh, the thyroid gland is one of those things that when you kind of run out of what could be wrong with my patient, don't forget about checking a thyroid or a TSH because often that's what the problem is, and it can go unnoticed if it's just not something you think. I'm glad you, you brought that up. Yeah, it's critical as part of an abnormal uterine bleeding workup. Okay. I don't know enough about that patient, so you'd have to tell me a little bit more about her age, any comorbid conditions, her body mass index. Yeah. Okay. 
So Anna says, I noticed you have spoken about adjusting medication choices based on patient's ability to afford their medication, especially with diabetes meds. Yeah. Um, she knows that this is a very important consideration in real life, but on the test, do they ask about affordability of treatment? Um, you know, I think they, they do in a way that you might not be thinking of. You know, the, the medicines that are usually asked about on your exam tend to be older medications. They give you both brand and generic names, so that should, should be a help to you. But um, generally, the older medications are more affordable, and so on your exam, there are three medications you really need to know a lot about with regard to type 2 diabetes. The first one is obviously metformin. Um, you need to know that it's very affordable and you need to remember that it's always your first go-to drug for a patient diagnosed with type 2 diabetes unless you have a really good reason not to use it. The second question, the second drug they always have a question about is a sulfonylurea. It's mostly related to its uh, common side effects where the first one is hypoglycemia. And the other common side effect of the sulfonylureas is weight gain. And why do you think it causes weight gain? Because it sort of kicks the pancreas to make it to stimulate it and make it produce more insulin. And so anytime you have patients who have insulin surges, it's associated with weight gain. So those are uh, the first two medications that you need to know about, certainly for your exam. The third mm -hmm. one is insulin, specifically NPH. Um, you know, the insulin analogs like Lantus and Levomir, just a little vial of that is in the neighborhood of $250. NPH, which can also be given once or twice daily, is about $25 a vial. So it's considerably less expensive. And you might see a question about an affordable form of insulin. Remember, NPH as opposed to Lantus or uh, Levomir. So those are the three meds I would, I would make sure that I knew about for my exam. The others are just very expensive and I, I just don't get a lot of feedback on meds that are asked about on the exam other than those. And in general, as a role or a practice question, they may ask you what are some of the barriers to you know, patients getting their medications and affordability may be one of them. Or if you have a patient that came in and you were doing an assessment and you found that they were not compliant with their medications, what are some of the reasons? In general, there may be some, but I don't think that they would ask you to compare prices on certain medications. I agree, Kathy, they would not do that. <laughs> well, they wouldn't want to waste a question on it. You know, that's something you could easily look up. Right, good point. So um, which ADA treatment guidelines will we be tested on this year? Well, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. So one of the things that I would like for you to do before you take your exam, whether it's AANP's exam or ANCC's exam, is I want you to go to the exam blueprint and I want you to look at the reference list. That's a list of resources that they used in order to write questions. And I think you'll be surprised to find that the reference list for type two diabetes or just diabetes in general is gonna be 2017, 2018. So it's not the latest greatest. And one of the things I always remind people about is that when you're preparing for this exam, knowing the latest greatest information is not always very helpful for you. But I would, I would tell you that once you check the reference list, you'll have a really good idea of you know, which, which references you ought to take a look at. But pay attention to the year. And I think you're going to be surprised at the age of, of the references. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything to add or Mimi? Mm -mm. No? No, nope, I think that's okay. a good. All right. But the, I can assure you that the content that I put in here is what you should be very familiar with <clears throat> the exam that you take in 2020. So I think right. you set for it. Nicole asked, do you think we will see questions regarding PSA values and how frequent to recheck 
what patients should we check back in a year versus two years? I, I really don't think you'll see anything. The PSA, of course, a prostate specific antigen. And you know, that whole body of knowledge is in a lot of turmoil right now. There are a lot of conflicting right. data and studies. And um, you know, if you remember from the United States Preventive Services Task Force and the, the exams, you know, look at them and they ask a lot of questions related to that as well. I shouldn't say a lot of questions, but they reference the United States Preventive Services Task Force. And they don't even think that a PSA should ever be ordered again. I mean, pretty much that's what they said. Wow. So I don't think you'll get questions about PSA and numbers on the exam. In your clinical practice, though, we like to see a PSA less than 2.5. Um, it's okay if it's higher than that, as long as it that's the number that has been stable. You know, if it's been a, a three for the last three years, I'm not so worried about it. But if it goes from a 1.2 to a three, that gets my attention. But the number for your clinical practice, it just kind of ought to be in your head, is a four. If the PSA is a four or higher, that patient needs a urology consult if it's consistent with their long-term plan for life. So, um, I, I don't think you're going to see questions about numbers, and uh, and I, I really, I don't think you'll see that. I just don't get that as feedback on either exam. Mm -hmm. But what you are probably going to be asked about is risk factors. And remember, we talked a little bit uh, in one of the earlier sessions about knowing the difference between screening for risk factors and screening using a testing modality. And this is one of those instances. So screening for risk factors that's something that you're gonna do with the male that may be at risk for developing prostate cancer. And as far as the PSA, the questions that I think you were more likely to see, the answer is gonna be shared decision-making. Hmm. Absolutely. That's a buzzword. It is yeah, because the American, the, cancer, yeah, American Cancer Society uses that term shared decision. I'm glad you brought that up, Kathy, thank you. I have to say that it's a bit comedic if you ask someone if they want a pap smear or a GYN exam, shared decision making, they're probably going to say no. <laughs> Would you like one today? Okay. All right, so Kathy, what are people thinking about? I don't see any more questions in there. I don't, I don't see, let's see, I closed the chat function. Let I me think they're it. tuckered out. Uh, yeah. You know, that's kind of, that's not, not unexpected and here's why. If you went through all of yesterday's videos yesterday, then you've gone through a year's worth of material in a day. And then today, you've gotten a whole nother year's worth of material. So mm -hmm. it's, it's how we do it in the live course as well. But, um, but you know, it's mentally taxing. And I always feel like it's easier to do a day's worth of physical activity than a day's worth of mental activity. So I bet, you, I bet you our class is feeling tired. I bet they are. Oh, it looks like we just got a question. Okay. We, did. we just Couple. got two. Nicole said, so you mentioned shared decision making. Are there any other buzzwords or phrases that mm -hmm. tend to be common in answers? That's, um, that's a pretty broad question. Yeah. Like Evidence-based practice. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good one, Mimi. Evidence-based practice is a good one. I'm thinking... Shared decision making. Cost benefit analysis, risk versus benefits. Oh, Mimi, you like you, you win and you got like four. I haven't I even thought know. of one yet. I don't know. <laughs> Great. Oh yeah, those are all good ones. Mimi, you you won that one, I gotta say. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Free thinking. <laughs> uh Kathy, can you think of any? I, I recognize, that's what I'm thinking. Gosh, Mimi, you're just throwing them out there. Oh, I know. I'm um, going through like every section in my brain and thinking, okay, I know. What's, a buzzword? what's a buzzword? All um, I know is on those questions, I think the, the questions that ask for wrong answers or everything but, I think those are the hardest questions, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, they're... You have to read every sentence, read the Oof. question, and then match it with the stem and say, not that one. Read the question, go, go to the next one. Read the question, right. with the third choice. That's how I always got through those. And if you don't do that in my brain, I, I was always lost. I was always yes. confused. 
So. Right. And I do know, I hear some students when I'm working with them, sometimes uh, they'll say, gosh, they just use words that I didn't know because we get in our little bubbles and using the terms that are um, slang terms, potentially, you're not going to see slang terms on the exam. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be the approved terminology. And so I do encourage you to, when you're reading, to pay attention to correct terminology for things, not the slang terms that we may use in the um, clinic setting or in the hospital setting. You know what I was thinking? The other thing about reading a question is make sure that you, when you read the words, like a, a, a word like osteoporosis, it's not really osteoarthritis. And when you read a word like immunocompromised, it's not immunocompetent. So make oh, sure good one, you, Amelie. Yeah, make sure you read the entire word because sometimes when you're anxious because you're taking an exam or, you know, you can just skip it. Your brain gets tired. So make sure that you read those words carefully because they entirely change your answer to the question. Agreed. Um, okay, can you recommend any good DERM app? I am not aware of any DERM apps, but I am aware of a wonderful resource that's in the APA store, and it's what we call the DERM Dex. There's one for adults and one for PD. They look like uh, different colored paint palettes, but when you open it up, they're all different images of rashes. And it's almost like when you first see it, you want to drop it because you don't want to touch those rashes. <laughs> first time I saw it, I'm like, what is this? But it's a fantastic resource. It shows the very same condition on different skin types, and then all the information on management is there as well. So um, they're called um, the Derm Dex. Yeah, I'm glad somebody asked that question. It's a good one. And the reason I said that is because I just read a study. There apparently is an app that you hold with your camera over a rash or a lesion and it goes through a differential and it, I mean, it goes through images and it tells you what should be part of your differential. And That's I thought, crazy. Oh, I got to find that. I thought it was a great idea, but the study that used it said that it was, it did a very, very poor job of differentiating and building a differential diagnosis. Darn. So if that's one of the ones you were thinking of, I, w I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't consider that. The other one that I am aware of is one that resides on your, um, smartphone and it downloads loads and loads of pictures. The issue with it is that it ties up a tremendous amount of space Oof. on your phone. And so, um, you know, I really do, Mimi, you talked about the Derm Deck. I yes. really like it. It's like paint chips and exactly. it shows you multiple different images of the same rash. And if it touches a patient, you can clean it. But if you have your phone in the exam room, and you're trying to compare the patient's whatever to the image on your phone, you don't want your phone that close to people. No, Ooh, no, 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 no. So, I, and in my I, experience, I, I have never found an app or an online resource that had images that were even remotely close to what my patient was experiencing. The Derm Deck has been the best for that. And I do like it because there are four different images per yep. diagnosis. And if it's something that occurs on different parts of the body, it shows it to you on different parts of the body because a rash on the chest, even though it's the same diagnosis, may look different on the chest than it does um, on the lower leg because the skin type is a little bit different. And so I think that's very helpful. It also has on the back of the card for you pertinent history findings that you can ask that patient because we all know that the patient comes in and they've already tried to treat it with apple cider vinegar and <laughs> tea tobacco tree paste oil. and uh -huh. all sorts of things there. And so um, always ask them with the advent of, of cell phones. I think it's really uh, helped our practice a lot. Can I see the picture of it of when it first started? Because they took a picture. And so that's always helpful. That's great, 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 great point. Great, point, great advice. advice. Yeah. You know what else? It's unusual to find a derm resource that has images as well as history and treatment. And the derm deck has that. That's why I've had several of them. 
I don't know how they, they walk out of my clinic, but they do. And, um, <laughs> but that's my favorite. And I have a load of derm, you know, books, Atlas of Dermatology, I have all those things, but my favorite is the derm deck. So mm -hmm. I agree. How about a so question, Megan, Kathy? We oh, do. We have some questions. Okay. Yay. You guys are great. Yay. Why does hepatitis C cause increased fungal infection? My immediate reaction to that was that it may be that they're immunocompromised, they have comorbid conditions. Uh, anyone with comorbid conditions, particularly diabetes, is gonna have more problems with fungal infections. Amelie, do you know if it's just the singular entity of hepatitis C, if they would have any reason for an increased risk? You know, I'm thinking of another uh, mechanism, and again, it goes back to pathophysiology, but, um, I think it has, it relates to glucose metabolism in the liver. And if you have hepatitis A, B, or C, or anything going on with your liver, it's not able to function optimally. And so I, I think it has to do with glucose metabolism, but, but Mimi, I think, uh, I think you're right on it with, you know, just a general state of, of being Im immunocompromised, you know? That's why I like answering these questions as a group because we just can help you. We can just, you know, chime in with all kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. This Absolutely. is fun. Kathy, you have any thoughts about that? I, I think it's probably a combination of both, actually. Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder if system and, and even some of the medications to treat can probably contribute um, as well because they're just tough on you. Yeah. I wonder if the person who wrote that question has seen fungal infections with hepatitis. Uh, I mean, I wonder, I've, I never made the connection in my brain before. It never really hit me, but it's, that's a good question. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking it. Oh yeah. So Megan asked, the rash most associated with lupus is the malar rash. I've heard there are other rashes that you may also see with lupus. Is this true? It is true. It is very true. There are many different skin conditions that can be associated with lupus, including photosensitivity, which can happen in, on the facial area related to the malar rash. Um, leg ulcerations are possible, nodules, uh, all kinds of different skin conditions can be linked to lupus. And all you have to do is Google it and you'll just see it, quite a laundry list. But I don't think they're gonna ask much other than the malar rash on the exam, do you think, Amelie? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think if you got the malar rash or the butterfly rash, and I don't think they're going to ask you, you know, what disease is the butterfly rash associated with? That's you know, a knowledge level question. Probably, you know, like, uh, yeah. That's like what's four plus four. You know, they're that's not going to ask that. But in the description of the patient, they may say, this patient came in today with elevated yeah. glucose and a cough, and she's got a, um, butterfly type rash so that's the way they kind of insert those things right and a cough probably has nothing to do with it but they insert little things and you have to be able to toss out the unimportant ones and right. you know, remember which one's important so that's why you need to know those assessment findings and don't forget anti-nuclear antibodies and um, just in terms of trivia you can even see alopecia and rainouts with uh with lupus so it's a quite a diverse autoimmune condition. It, it is, and remember that um, lupus, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, even though it's all in that same constellation of diseases, um, lupus affects the soft tissue as well as the joints. So those patients can come in with all sorts of symptoms. That's you know, why you have to go through a complete review of systems with those oh, patients. Yeah. And what's, what's the most common symptom they present with? Starts with an F. Fatigue. Fatigue, exactly. All right. It's not flatulence. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. I can't help myself. <laughs> and you hadn't been drinking, huh, Mimi? <laughs> I got water in here. It kind of right. looks a little bit like some kind of spike thing, but it's just straight up water. You sure about that, huh, Mimi? Uh, I might need to funny. test that. <laughs> She's quick on those words today, Dr. Amelie. She's quick. Uh, I, know, I see that. <laughs> so Nicole said when, when someone was talking, I don't remember if it was Dr. Mimi or Dr. Amelie was talking about an app for derm. She wants to know, is it called the visual diagnosis? That's it. 
That's exactly. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm looking it up. Okay. All right. Yep. Uh, Jeremy says, do you have any advice on choosing the best answer if we come across a question with a topic that we are not very familiar with? Just basically um, <laughs> question answering strategies. Oh, I love this answer, Amelie. <laughs> How do you know what I'm going to say, Mimi? You know I was guessing. All right. So listen, you know, I usually tell people I'm probably the biggest nerd in the room. But you know, since I was in the fourth grade, and I'm serious, I remember this. Since I've been in the fourth grade, every time I've gone in to take an exam, I have always had a plan in my head. Like, what am I gonna do if? What am I gonna do if this? And I always, I always think, if I get a multiple choice question and I have no idea how to answer it, I'm picking A. My name is Amelie, it starts with an A, I'm picking A. And statistically, you know, you'll get more correct if you pick the same one every time when you have no idea than if you kind of jump around. So, <laughs> so I mean, I always pick A. But you shouldn't have any questions that you're just totally dumbfounded about. Mm -hmm. um, you might in the first 20 questions of your exam, here's why. Because when you first go in, you just need to know and be prepared that you're gonna be somebody who's gonna be very nervous and everybody's anxiety, anxiety will be at a different level. So if you're really one of those anxious people or you have test anxiety, the first 20 questions on your exam are gonna be like, they gave me the wrong exam. So just know that in those first 20, know that you're gonna settle into a rhythm, mark it as one you wanna come back to. And when, once you settle down and you know that you know the answer, when you go back and reread those questions, I don't think you're gonna find anything that's just totally I never, I don't even know what they're talking about. I really don't think that you'll see that. So, but I pick A when I don't know, I pick A. And is there an, is more. there an answer that is actually statistically more likely to be right? Is I always thought it was all no. the above if that was there, but no, I, no, I don't. They won't have all the above on the exam. Okay. You know, I, I don't know that idea. I don't know, but if I really don't know one, you know, to be successful on this exam. You have to have a good memory and a short memory, a good memory to pull information out. But when you get a question that you couldn't answer, if you had the internet at your disposal, answer it, forget about it and move on to the next one. Yep. You know, don't, don't get down on yourself. Let it go. Know also that you can probably miss two of every three questions and still pass this exam. Two wow. of every three. That doesn't make me feel comfortable. I want wow. you to get three of every four. But when they used to report scores, that was a score. And I don't think it's changed very much. I really think it's about two of every three. So whew, I think you can pass. Let it go. You know, you I do think hard. it's important, right, to, and to have a good test strategy. And I saw someone ask a question on the chat about were the practice questions different than the questions that are in the question book. And so I know that some people have the question book. I think it's very important that you practice some questions online. Your certification exam is going to be online. There's some of us that study best from a book and we'll circle and underline and highlight and write notes and that's great. However, you're not gonna have a handwritten exam. It's gonna be online. And so you do need to practice answering questions online and you need to get a habit down. Mm -hmm. Read the stem of the question, formulate an answer, look at the answer choices. If your answer choice isn't there, then sometimes it's not. You go back to the stem of the question, you read it, you pick out keywords. You can usually narrow it down to two if you automatically don't know the right answer and then go back and read the stem again with those two answer choices in mind, like Amelie said earlier, applying that answer choice and take your best guess and move forward. But you need to be in the habit of doing that because you, one of the things that you don't wanna do is get bogged down on a question mm -hmm. that you don't know and spend a lot of time there and then run out of time for questions later on. So if you're in a process of answering that way and you've got a good system down, then you're going to spend the, the correct amount of time that you need to spend on each question and have time to go back and review if you need to. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, Kathy. Yeah, um, thanks, Kathy. 
Yeah, you know, one more piece of advice I, I would like to uh, share with people is this one. If you have, uh, if you have a book, like you have our, our book of questions, which I like because the questions are not knowledge level, they're at the synthesis comprehension and analysis level. That's how the certification exam is gonna ask you questions. It's not knowledge level, it's synthesis comprehension and analysis. So our APEA question book gives you questions at that level, but you can also make more questions. And I tell people, if, to be successful on this exam, you have to be a good critical thinker. And so take a question that's in the book, I guess you could do it with one online as well, and change one word in the stem of the question. So maybe it's a 75 year old with community acquired pneumonia, change it to a 24 year old and ask yourself, how will I answer that question differently? Because your answer is gonna be different. And so if you do that with the questions, change one key fact in the stem of the question, all of a sudden you have a whole nother question. And that's how patients are when they come into your exam room. You know, they're a little bit different than the other pneumonia that you saw. They're a little bit different than the, and you'll really see your critical thinking skyrocket once you begin to do that. I agree. Great advice. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we got a question. Well, he said thanks. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you are you welcome for asking the question. Thanks, Ger German. I'm not sure how you say your name, but thanks. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Well, so really, you're welcome. And the reason we are here is because we want you to be successful on this exam. And so, you know, I think I've said a couple of other sessions. Um, when you ask questions, you have the benefit of almost 100 years of nurse practitioner knowledge yeah. between Kathy, Mimi, and I. So, so ask away. That's it's kind of scary, huh, Kathy? It kind of well, is I'm scary. Thinking, but... I'm thinking I'm the youngest, so y'all can go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're an adolescent. <laughs> you just don't. He said we're saying his name right. Uh, which QBank is best to purchase for studying? That's from Beverly. You know, it kind of depends on where you are in your studying. If you feel like you've got a pretty decent grasp of the material, you still have a lot of stuff to learn, but you have a decent grasp of the material, I usually encourage people to get my QBank management because management incorporates, you know, uh, diagnosis and assessment and prescribing it is kind of the whole thing and if you get QBank management you know it's a subscription product and I would encourage you to really really focus on the rationales you're gonna watch your knowledge base just stretch immensely once you begin to inhale the rationales really look at them and you'll see that it's a great great learning tool and it also allows you to track everything you know mm. you can track how your numbers are, are improving over time. And I usually tell people, if I can talk to them, that I would like them at the end of their subscription, I'd like to see your overall percent correct, 90 or 95%. When you start answering questions, you might be in the 50 or 60% correct. You know, you may be there, and then it just kind of goes up. And you can choose to re-answer the questions you missed to make sure that you got those concepts. So that's why I like my QBank. You can, you can tell it how you want to study, whether it's subject specific or ones you've never seen before, or, you know, like Kathy talked about practice, like a practice test. You could, you could tell it, give me a hundred questions in a practice test. So, and it'll track everything over time and you should see your percent correct over time, doing nothing but going straight up. And when you finish with that bank, I would love to see that overall percent correct at 90 or 95 percent you really will have gotten your money's worth out of that bank Kathy, there are more you, graphics in that too aren't there in the q bank actually the yes. actual book there, there are graphics are. in there with um some of them are images you know if it's a derm or a bone or things like that and uh but sometimes it's a chart or maybe it's a cbc that you have to interpret uh, with the other questions that are you know that the patient's information is given and then you have to go and look at labs. So I'll, I'll love it. I think it's a great tool and it's a good study tool as well. And those are all questions that you can, you can learn from, you know, that's the that's, value of them. 
that's also how they're going to take their exam at the computer. So it gives them that sort of comfort of, okay, I can do this on the computer. Yeah. If they're right. older students, that might be very helpful. Beverly also asked, is it needed in addition to the predictor? Uh, well, talking about the QBank. There are two different tools. You know, QBank, there are two kinds of questions. Questions that teach you things. That's what QBank is. Mm -hmm. And there are questions that measure things. Your certification exam is going to give you questions that measure things. APEA's predictor exam are questions that measure things. And Kathy is our psychometric analyst. She knows numbers, she crunches them, she looks, and any question that's in that predictor exam, the APEA predictor exam, has already had established reliability and validity. That means that statistically, that's a good question. And those are the kinds of questions you're gonna see on your exam. So what I would do is I would get questions like QBank that, that really stretch your knowledge base and give you practice. But when you want to know whether you're ready to take the certification exam, I wouldn't go in and take that exam without taking an APEA predictor exam because that predictor exam will let you know whether or not you're ready. If your score is not 70% or greater on the APEA predictor exam, I don't think you're ready yet. I wouldn't go take it. And what I would do when I took it, if my overall score was like 64%, I would look at my score report and I would see, you know, what what questions I had missed, what was the topic area? And, you know, what knowledge areas was I weak in? And that's what I would use to, to kind of guide my studying with the predictor exam. But I wouldn't go in to take a $300 exam without having tried a predictor exam. Uh, that's how much confidence I have in the predictor. Cool. And that's why we developed it. We are the only people in the business who have an exam that predicts. Some people say, you know, they have a readiness test and they have a something else, but statistically, statistically, we can tell you whether or not you're ready to take that exam. Thank you, Kathy. It looks like you brought this up. So this Great. is a, what your predictor exam summary would look like. On the far left, it gives you all the knowledge areas. And that plus sign is what you click on. It opens up and allows you to see the topic in the, of the questions in that area. So like in dermatology, this person must have had a question on planning for scabies. Well, like who plans <laughs> to get scabies? But you know, your plan to treat scabies, that's what that's about. Um, a human bite. Um, the X means that that was also in the plan of care, you know, how you would manage them, but they didn't get it right. So this one really just like drills down into what you knew and what you didn't know. And if your knowledge area like dermatology is 42%. That red means Oof. you're weak in dermatology and you really need to go beef up that area. In fact, even if my overall score, Kathy, can you pull it down just a little bit? The overall score at the top, okay, well, somebody, we scratched it, it's right there. So 67%. Wow. Even if my score was 74%, any knowledge area that is less than 70%, I would go and beef up. I would go in and stretch my knowledge base just in case I got an exam that was very uh, cardiovascular heavy or derm heavy. This student right now is going to have trouble with an exam like that because their cardiovascular and dermatology scores are not optimal, which is, you know, green. Um, I think this person must have done better as the, as the score report went down. Can you roll it, Kathy? Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, see, they did way better down here. You see your green areas like mm -hmm. gastroenterology? I wouldn't spend my time studying GI. You need to spend your time in men's health. You need to spend your time in psych, uh, respiratory, ENT. That's how you can focus your studying. That's why this is such a valuable tool. It's great. So, I don't know. I get into all this stuff because people can you know, can make their life easier when you have a good idea of where you should spend your time studying. Where well, the heck were you when I started, when I became an NP Amelie, for gosh sakes. It and was so, so primitive. Oh. Yeah. Well, how, how long has that been, Dr. Mimi? A thousand years. <laughs> 
So Cubank management, there are several Cubanks that you'll see on our, our website. We have Cubank assessment, we have uh, prescribing, we have pathophysiology, and we have Cubank management. And um, we're developing another one now, but that's not up there yet. So those are the four we have. But in Cubank management, you're going to get all of these questions. You're going to get assessment questions, diagnosis questions, planning and implementation, evaluation, and farm questions. So that's the most well-rounded Cubank that you can use to study from at this point in time. If you feel like if you do take a predictor exam and you look at this down here, I went too fast. Um, you see pharmacotherapeutics, this person scored a 48. And so prescribing is a weak area. And so they may want to consider QBank management and QBank prescribing because that's a weak area for them. And that's one of the things that we can do as nurse practitioners that we couldn't do as nurses as prescribe. And so you definitely want to make sure that you're familiar with that information. Yeah, it's, it's common. I mean, I see it all the time. The weakest part of most people's knowledge bases is their pharmacology. It, it just is, unless you're a pharmacist. And I've had a few pharmacists who've come to NP school, but that's the weakest part of most people's knowledge base. So um, the QBank prescribing is, you know, that's a, that's a good one too. This is great. <laughs> just fascinating. Students are lucky to have this resource. That's all I know. <laughs> well, thank you, Mimi. This was not around you know, when I came up either. I, I, I mean, I guess I'll tell you, that's how old I am, but I've been doing this for almost 25, 25 years. And when I started in an NP program, there was not a question book on the market. There wasn't even a book of practice questions. And that's why the first thing I did as I was planning, this is what this industry needs. The first product that we ever produced was a question book because cool. How could you take an exam if you didn't have the tools you needed to help you? Don't get me started. What else are they asking about, Kathy? It was, well, it was a um, big surprise, Amelie. The test was a big surprise. A big surprise? <laughs> I don't have another question right now. I but like Cracker week. Jacks, a big surprise. <laughs> Prizes are not good when you take a high stakes exam. Maybe. Oh, no, no, no they're, they're not. not. PTSD not is what it does. <laughs> So one thing I want to point out before we leave this uh, report is that the total exam time for this person was two hours and two minutes. And remember, we talked a little bit about having a systematic way of answering questions. So that means that that person on average spent about 83 seconds on each question. Um, um, I think I, I think I told that right. And so you really... So. No, I don't think I did, now that I'm saying it out loud. Really, the average amount of time for a question is mm -hmm. about 1.12, 1 minute, 0. 0.12 seconds. Exactly. Wow. Perfect. You got it, Kathy. <laughs> so this so, person so that's why it's important. This person may have missed some key words in the stem of questions, and that may be why some of their areas were low, because they were just mm -hmm. reading too fast and not paying particular attention and didn't have a systematic way of answering questions. How much time do they have for the exam? Three hours. Three hours. Three hours. AANP's oh. exam gives you 150 questions, three hours. ANPC's oh. exam gives you 175 questions and three and a half hours. So, so if you move from question to question at a one minute per question pace, you should have plenty of time to get through all the questions with a chunk of time left over to go back and revisit those questions that you know that you need a little bit more thought with. So one thing that concerns me when I see something like this is that this person went through this thing pretty quickly. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's not a race against time. Mm -mm. You know, that's why it's really important to practice. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of crazy, but you do. Yeah. yeah. Some people Plus it calms you down, right? You're kind of into the routine. Because mm -hmm. generally people are pretty nervous. Well, it's a high stakes exam. And, you know, as somebody who worries about everything, you know, it's maybe worry is not the right word, but 
you always want to do your best. And when you put in this much time and money over a period of, you know, two years for most people, sometimes longer, you want to do your best and you want to shine. And, you know, if you've done all this and you put in all this time, you realize that this is where you want to be. You want to be an NP. And if that's what you want to do, you got to pass this exam. If you want to be paid for what you're going to do, you got to pass this exam. So it's a big deal. And, and you know, I, I want people to do well. I just do. I want you to do well. I want you to be a good NP. And maybe it's selfish because I, you might have to be taking care of me one day. And oh, I me. want you to do a good job. Man, oh, man. <laughs> That was Running very helpful. Dr. Mimi in the airport, take good care of her, okay? She wears a hat, but then she talks to everyone, so. Yeah, she <laughs> kind of puts on a baseball cap to hide. I'm telling you her secret. It's my, it's my little, yeah. I hide, but I'm always there to help people. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what I'll tell you? If, uh, if Mimi sees you in the airport, and if you met her two years ago, she's going to say, oh, Marilyn, I remember. It's amazing. She's Maybe. Amazing. On Mimi, a good day. Mimi is amazing. I don't know how you remember all these people's names, but That's somehow you do. So do we have any more questions, Kathy? No more questions. Uh, they're chatting a little bit with the APEA staff on chat about the QBanks and working out some issues there. Oh, and Sorry, we do have a page. Out. There's a link that you can go to if you're interested in any of the products and you can get the same discount that you would have gotten had this course been in a live venue. So, and it's free um, shipping, correct? Free shipping on any uh, book or product like that. And, and the online products, I, I believe, are all discounted. So, um, And okay. Nina has made sure that there's no coronavirus on your packages. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> they have cleaned and cleaned and wow. cleaned. So, wow. And you know, I just want to mention that this was quite an effort on the part of APEA to pull this off. Or was this in less than a week? Basically less than a week. And uh, yeah, so I think their dedication to you as students is clear in this initiative. And I just want to thank you for working so hard the past week to pull this off. Thank you, Mimi. Um, you know, all of you. We wanted to make sure that this darn thing went off well. You know, it was the first time that, I mean, the world has not seen coronavirus. I guess we've had some pandemics in the 1800s, but yeah, um, we wanted to make sure that we could roll something out that worked well and that got our students prepared and that allowed us to kind of talk and meet with our, our students. You know, that to me is golden. And so, oh yeah. Um, you know, we, I wish that the people on this could meet the people in our office who are responsible. You know, my face is here and Kathy and Mimi, but if y'all would know the work that the people behind us do to make sure that everything for you is as pristine as we can get it, um, you, would, you would really enjoy meeting our people. They're, they're just terrific. They're fun to work with. They're fun to be with. And Including the three on our call, Michelle, Maureen, and Nina. Oh, yes. oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys um, are awesome. We, we, just, we just have the best people that we work with. And, you know, I, I think I want to work till I'm 100 also, Mimi, because I love 110, it. don't say 100. 110. I want to for sure hit triple digits. We got to keep the bar high. <laughs> um, all right. So it still looks like there's chatting going on. Well, uh, minimal. Saying thank you. Um, yeah. We do uh, have, Megan says, thank you so much. The hybrid format of this course has been great. Will you continue to offer the hybrid course? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's great. I love these group uh, Q and A's. I'll, of course, I'll we don't get to hear each other's uh, conversations always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it that uh, Dr. Loretta Ford says? Chaos creates uh, opportunity. Oh, oh totally. yeah, opportunity for change. Opportunity, that's chaos. right, right. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows where this chaos will lead? Better right. healthcare, a lot more virtual healthcare, a lot more virtual CE. Yeah. Correct. 
Emily says we appreciate you all. Thank you, Emily. Oh, thank you, Emily. Well, you are welcome. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Mary said, I also have enjoyed it. I appreciate all the work to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, well, believe me, it's been our pleasure. Um, we, wouldn't, we would not do this if we did not enjoy helping students, helping people and helping students. And I love to take care of patients, but you know, you can only take care of them one at a time. And when you teach, you have an opportunity to take care of so many patients at the same time. And you know, that's part of what drives me every day because you know it's hard to do this and it's hard to travel but um but the opportunity to help people and and impact patient care is what drives me every day so you are welcome but all of us yeah. yeah beverly german and Brittany all said thank you so much it's been great and thank you for your dedication to future nps uh you're welcome we just want to pay it forward Paying it forward is a good thing to do. It is. It sure is. Okay, team. Okay, yeah. So if you guys, um, we're going to give you just a, a, about two more minutes here. And if we don't have any other questions that pop up, um, then we'll be signing off. So it's My watch just told me to stand up. 6.51. So... 653 if you have any more questions for us it's kind of funny because i just took a walk so why is it pestering me <laughs> i don't know how how good was your walk mimi it was great i broke all records you did yeah it feels so good to be able to move again wow so i walked around the whole bay in uh, about 40 minutes normally it would take me about an hour and i'd be begging for a piggyback ride yeah, three quarters of the way around. that's awesome Mm. I got in six miles before it started raining. Woo! Good job, you, Kathy. Kathy. I'm going to try to get out. I just noticed the temperature is now down to 72 degrees. Yay. I'm sure it's going to be very humid, but I'm going to try to get out and get just a little bit of exercise. You know, all the gyms are closed here. Yep. So you got to just be kind of go for the natural world. Yeah, you got to be creative. I have a gym in my neighbor's basement and I just <laughs> cleaned it and it's just spit and polished and all organized. Mimi, nobody but you would be able to find a private gym. I found it, I knew I'd find one. <laughs> That's, did you go, I wanna know, did you go knock on doors? Well, I knew my friend hey, had one. Okay. So I just scrolled through these people in the, in the town that I, I thought might, might have one. So. And you just okay. knocked on the door and said, can I please use your gym? Well. <laughs> Yeah. Emily said she has a gym and Cynthia said she's so sorry that you missed all this beautiful Phoenix weather. Oh, oh I we am love too. Phoenix. We all adore Phoenix, the botanical garden, the butterfly pavilion, oh, all of it. I know. Love but we're going to be it. back in October. Um, we're going to be back in Phoenix in October and it's uh, October is a great time to be in the desert as well. So mm -hmm. if you, if you come back before you take your exam, the comeback, um, to come back is always just a just about half price, so come meet us. We would love Good to reminder. And uh, and Amelie, you sure look like you're there. Well, I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm in picture. the desert because you know, wish I was there. <laughs> oh, Randy said thank you for sharing your time and knowledge, and Cynthia said she'll be taking boards in November, so she'll be there again. Oh, awesome. Good. That's great, well, Cynthia. We'd, we'd love to meet you. And I'm sure that we'll be in good shape. Oh yeah, yeah, by that time. Okay, well it's 6.53 and we don't have any, uh, any further questions. All, All right. right, well, I think we ought to wrap this up. Mimi and Kathy, thank you so much for being with us. And to everybody who's still out there and listening, good luck on your exam. Send us an email when you pass because I love to send out congratulatory emails. Best of luck, everybody. Yes. All right. Thanks, Thanks team. All. Good luck to y'all.